Reading the history give you a good mindset to learn this field. Taking classes and whatnot are fine, and books are fine, but every single electrical experimenter throughout history that I've ever read basically looked at what other people did, repeated their experiments, learned from that, and then added their next little bit. And there aren't any real completely independent researchers because they all stood on the shoulders of those people came before them. So it makes me wonder about our own time with our own level of understanding. We think of ourselves as so superior technically. But what's going to be looked back at about our time of what we don't know? Hello. Disclaimer here. There's something I have to tell you before we can begin. The information provided by Tammy Lightning is designed to provide helpful information and to educate on the subjects discussed. That being said, the information provided is true and complete to the best of our knowledge, and is not intended to be used without professional guidance or supervision. All recommendations are made in good faith by both Taming Lightning and affiliates, to which we disclaim any liability in connection with the use of the information we provide. Thus, we ask that you be safe, be informed, and ask questions. Let's get right to it. Hi, I'm Emily, the Assistant Director of Glass Education Exchange, aka Geeks. Are you learning or teaching glass in the middle of a pandemic? That's right, I'm talking about COVID-19. Geeks is here to support the present and ongoing needs of educators and co-learners through virtual programming and resources, including our Geeks Talks lecture series, our calendar of public glass-related events, community spotlights, and other programming like our monthly book club and weekly movement class. All of our programs are free, donation-based, or low cost to increase accessibility. You can check us out on the web at geeks.glass and on all social platforms as Geeks Glass. That's one word. Welcome back or welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II. I'm the creator and host of Taming Lightning, as well as the Emerging Plasma Tech at Pittsburgh Glass Center. Taming Lightning Podcast features a series of conversations to help expand our understanding of plasma and neon light, looking beyond its associations with novelty and sign making, and to explore the potential for noble gases as an artistic medium. Hello, Lightning Tamers. This is episode number 38. And in today's podcast, I have Wayne Stratman. Wayne's work encompasses over 30 years of innovation in lighted glass plasma technology as an artist, designer, researcher, teacher, advocate, and author. Since 1983, Wayne's Boston based company, Stratman Design, has grown to become a global leader in crafting lighted glass plasma displays for science museums worldwide, and Creative Kinetic Plasma Sculpture, a fusion of glass, gas, and electricity. Combining his background training in engineering with his love of sculpture and interest in the history of electricity, specifically those technologies used in glass, Wayne not only taught himself the field without any formal glass training, but also proceeded to pioneer many new techniques now intrinsic to his medium. Through exploring and researching every aspect of the subject, from glass blowing methods to the design of the vacuum equipment, gauges, and high voltage electronic power supplies, Wayne began creating and teaching neon art, including a two semester course in scientific glass blowing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In addition to teaching, he wrote extensively for the neon art journal Signs of the Times contributing to over 100 articles and receiving American Business Press Editor's Award for Technical Journalism. Wayne also published a textbook called Neon Techniques, which remains as an industry standard. His work ultimately has ventured beyond the conventional neon, advancing current technologies through utilizing a number of his original patented lighting techniques. Wayne received the first and only Ph.D. in Neon Art and Technology 
by published papers from the UK University of Sunderland in 2008, for his many years of advocacy and advancement in the field. With a desire to foster the recognition of lighted glass sculpture and encourage the ongoing engagement with the medium among emerging artists, Wayne has curated exhibitions and supported the International Glass Art Society by serving on their board of directors and founding and endowing their critical dialogue lecture series that examines the relationship between today's glass art practices and their place in the context of both historical and contemporary fine art. Wayne has taught master classes for artists at Pilchuck Glass School, Penland School of Craft, Corning Museum of Glass, Urban Glass, Norfolk, and the International Festival of Glass in the UK. In 2017, Wayne was honored as a recipient of the International Glass Art Society's annual Lifetime Membership Award. Wayne has invented unique lighting technologies such as Lumen Glass, an interactive flat panel plasma light that Star Trek fans will recognize as the charging station for the Borg. While working on the creating of a plasma TV, he came up with a process of fusing window glass together in a kiln to make flat glass light up and was kinetic. Today, his work remains on the cutting edge of lighted glass engineering, with many recent developments of new effects never seen before. Welcome to the Taming Lightning podcast. Um, digging into your background here, so you started in engineering and that brought you into Neon. Well, what started your interest in engineering? Was that something early on that you've always been tinkering with or how'd that begin? Um, absolutely. I have always, um, my father was, um, had a great shop in our basement and, um, he passed away when I was a kid, but I, uh, took over his shop basically. But, uh, when he was alive, he used to bring home these technical publications, which was all the rage in the post Sputnik era. They tried to stimulate our, uh, country and people become engineers and scientists because we were in this space race with the, with the Soviet union back then. And, uh, so I grew up, you know, in an age of science fiction and all this stuff that was exploding, um, going to the big world fair, um, back in New York, which was the world of the future stuff. So in all my friends, we were, uh, builders of stuff. You know, we built all sorts of things that were, uh, as dangerous as we could get from fireworks to, you know, cars and hovercrafts and all this other stuff. So I was always a builder and interested in engineering. Um, I didn't go right into it. I, uh, had to go to get my first degree and do a lot of traveling around until I came back and did a, another undergrad degree in, in engineering. Um, but that other earlier degree in, in liberal arts was actually uh, very, very valuable to becoming an artist because it gave a lot of context to creating of art out of the technology. So, you know, I kind of had a current interest in my uh, really interest in glass because I was making, wanting to make a laser at uh, school, an engineering degree, and got involved with glass a little bit and vacuum, completely naive, learning out of books or just going around and visiting people. Um, and, um, you know, I was in the engineering world and then gravitated towards things that uh, involve vacuum and high voltage uh, ultimately ending up um, being project manager on uh, building a large space simulation chamber for testing the GPS satellites. When I say large, it was a 60-foot diameter sphere. Wow. It got down to the uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 8 in vacuum and was used to test those satellites before they were set up. So, and, well, I mean, that you're, how well, what material was that sphere made out of? Stainless steel. Stainless steel. I was like, of course. All welded together. <laughs> I was like, in order to get down to those yeah, vacuums, the, you really couldn't do that with glass, could you? Oh no! And the, <laughs> the door was on a railroad car. Yeah, uh, I it see. was so big, <laughs> and it was it was actually machined in the field because it was, you couldn't move it. It was too big. As a matter of fact, all the parts of that had to come by barge because they couldn't 
uh, go over the roadways because the parts are just too big. And uh, so I was only a project manager uh, on what's called the thermal shroud inside, which is a big, gigantic heat exchanger made out of welded uh, aluminum that we either flooded with freon or liquid nitrogen to simulate the hot and cold of space. Hmm. This is what the satellite would see. And, uh, and our company also made uh, uh, 48-inch diameter cryo pumps, uh, liquid helium cryo pumps that uh, did a lot of the final pumping down to the 10 to the minus 8. It is kind of a, an interesting one fingerprint left in that chamber would have contaminated it so it would never reach vacuum. So the cleanliness was very, very high. <laughs> like, speaking about that, like, you know, if you're leaving some sort of residue, whether it's fingerprint or oil or whatever, is it is it more disastrous in a larger volume to have that tiny little particulate than in a smaller volume? Or is it just no, – or is it the same? No, it's worse than this. Uh, worse than the smaller. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it's funny that the guys who worked on it, you know, welders and whatnot, used to ask whether if they went in there, uh, would there still be gravity? <laughs> Could they float around like in outer space? But I had to break their hearts and tell them, you know, gravity still exists. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I guess at that time, people's reference for vacuum was space, and what they understood about space was, you know, less yeah. gravity. Right. Then I was working in various other engineering jobs and uh, just decided um, at one point I was making a lot of plasma globes and things on the side, and I was teaching in a couple of schools, <clears throat> neon art, uh, which in the Northeast, I was the first ever to teach that, <clears throat> but it became wildly popular. And uh, I decided, well, I'm going to give a shot starting my own business. And I intentionally started on April Fool's Day, thinking this is probably <laughs> the most foolish move I can make, you know, leave a... <laughs> You know, a good engineering job to uh, enter our crazy field. But I stayed with it because I, I never liked the idea of working for someone else. There's an old saying, you know, working for someone else is exactly that. Um, I like, I just didn't care for that structure of having a boss, you know. Right. Uh, it's a different, it's a different set of parameters to work for yourself. Yeah. And you succeed or fail. <clears throat> you know, on your own terms. And um, it's, it's a lot, I, you know, completely naive. Uh, nobody in my family had college degrees. Nobody ever started a business. You know, I had no mentorship whatsoever. I just stumbled through it and made so many mistakes. But, you know, here I am 35 years or so later. Um, if you can list just like maybe three of the the mistakes that you were able to learn from and what those lessons were, what would those what would that be in, in starting your own business? Well, there's a whole whole category of them around uh, having employees and trying to manage people is not easy, right. and um, there's so much to choose from. Most of them were uh, done out of ignorance. I just didn't understand at the time, you know, how much stuff has to go out of your door and be sold on a constant basis just to keep up with overhead. And something I had never experienced is when the economy has um, periodic downturns, uh, it's like somebody comes along and just turns off all the switches for your orders. Yeah. And you have to maintain um, reserves for that. You know, it could be six months, a year, two years. Uh, there was a big downturn in 89, 90, which was, for me, devastating. I was living in Kansas Soup. <laughs> and uh, went around 2000, and um, by the time the 2008 and 9, I sort of had figured it out, you know. So I, I, it didn't affect me that much. And a lot, a lot of things, uh, I'll say one thing I did learn, a lot of the difficulties um, that you experience, all your competitors have to experience that too. Mm-hmm. So it can work in your favor if you're smart enough or work hard enough or lucky enough to get through them because so oftentimes you leave other people behind who don't prepare. So, and, um, it requires, uh, financial planning. Uh, really, uh, when times are good, um, don't go out and buy yourself a whole bunch of things and, <laughs> you know, feather your own nest, basically, uh, save, uh, diligently for those times that are going to be lean because they will come inevitably. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. In some ways, we're kind of feeling that again during this <laughs> pandemic. Oh, my God. Oh, this, yeah. is a, this is a tough one. Yeah. 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 Let's talk a little bit more about your business. For most people that visit your website, they see that you make these amazing lamps. But that isn't all that you do for your business. You also do other services and jobs that relate to this field. Could you spend some time to tell us a little bit about what those things are? Well, I can go back over the – I keep – changing, you know, uh, as the market changes and interests change. But, you know, I've, I've worked designing my own products, which are on my website, and mm-hmm. there's many of them. And I designed products in the 90s for, um, uh, I licensed this for Fire East Manufacturer. And, um, and they were basically a lot of the lighted things you saw in Spencer Gifts and similar stores in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, I also did technical consulting for Corning for a little over six years, I believe, uh, and with their advanced lighting products division, which was a direct result of me writing the column for Signs of the Times magazine uh, that I did for 10 years. Um, I was recommended to them, and what a great recommendation. It, it turns out it was my dream consultancy. I was working with really, really good engineers, um, and Corning, a lot of vision in that company, and they're willing to spend money for equipment and whatnot to try new things. And I mean, it really shows today that they're a leading corporation because of that attitude. They really were focused on engineering and, and physics developments in, in world glass and lighting. Um, and I've also done uh, quite a bit of teaching. Um, I, I taught adult ed classes continuously for 14 years. One course would end, the next one would start, and I was teaching uh, two to three nights a week at up to three schools at a time. And um, all that comes together, you know, mixing the art and the science. Um, interestingly, I brought a lot of artists to help Corning uh, develop some of their products. Uh, artists typically have a a view of, well, let's, let's try it. We don't know if it works. Let's give it a try. Whereas a lot of the engineering type minds will come up with the reasons it can't work without trying it. And I think that's uh, something they can learn from the artist. Just go for it. Give it a try. See, see if you can make it work. Right. So I had really powerful, strong, uh, technical people that I got involved, um, one of which you've met, my friend, good friend, Nick Reinhardt, who's absolutely brilliant. <clears throat> but then I had artists, <clears throat> excuse me, a glassmaker friend who uh, also was a watchmaker. And he was so absolutely precise. He was able to do things with glass that nobody else could do. So the two fields overlap. And uh, pretty much only in the last little over 100 years, we've unfortunately made a distinction between the uh, the artists and the scientists where there's a lot of things that they have in common. Yeah. I think, like you said, I think the only way to help remedy that while still kind of making the distinction is, is recognizing the overlaps. That's where a lot of yeah. the magic really happens. Um, in a lot of these things, like, especially when we reference yeah. to lumen glass, where, um, if I, if I read this correctly, you, it came about designing, uh, like a, a plasma TV sort of deal, and that lumen glass uh, interactive plate came out of that exploration. Partially, partially, yes. Um, it originally, was a, a tail light for trucks. That Corning has had this process since the 1950s called sheet coin glass, where a glass comes out of a, a furnace melt, it pours through rollers, and then the hot sheet uh, goes on top of a vacuum form. It vacuum forms uh, an impression, and then uh, another sheet goes over the top and seals, and they punch that out. So you have a a plate of whatever shape you want to make with these internal channels. And the idea was to fill those with originally neon, and then but later with um, argon mercury. Um, unfortunately, the problem that killed that was the argon mercury on the backlight for LCD TVs needed a phosphor coating. And we couldn't figure out a way of getting a uniform phosphor coating inside of some of these small panels that had like 17 feet of channel. And very, very difficult. 
um, technical problem. But it's a wonderful process, but I think Corning has probably spent 60 <laughs> years trying to commercialize it to do something um, so far. They got very close with the, the taillights. Uh, mm -hmm. From the way I understand, the, uh, uh, the talk was they introduced these flat panel light-up taillights at the Society Automotive Engineers trade show at the same time LEDs came out. And LEDs were flexible, more flexible, and at half the cost. So a couple hundred million dollars worth of development just went right out the window almost overnight. Mm. But we did a lot of really good work on it, though. <laughs> it was a very fun project. Yeah, it's, it's, this is you know, it's really exciting to, to kind of hear about these these coming coming abouts and and these tertiary, you know tertiary projects that goes on. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of want to go back to, I keep jumping back further into some things I've been listening to you from saying is, um, you, you mentioned that you started teaching like basic neon classes in the Northeast. It was that something that wasn't, yep. um, uh, at that time was not like available. Like people weren't really teaching no. neon. <laughs> this is very early on. This is 1983. I think I started and, uh, I just taught a one night sort of survey class about neon art. In my studio and uh from the local adult ed and everybody says oh you got to teach us you got to teach us and i said tell you what come back in a month and i'll develop uh like a six-week course uh for teaching neon and um that's what i did and um i was pretty green back then i didn't i didn't even know what i didn't know but i i you know could make things light up and this is just a neon art class so mm -hmm. We twisted up glass, we put electrodes on it, and we lit them up, and we had a good time. And matter of fact, back then in Boston, some of the schools I taught for were all in competition with each other. So one I taught for, I think it's called the Learning Adventure, we used to deliver big tubs full of beer and wine in it for every class. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it was, it was party time, you know, and uh, very social, a lot of fun. Um, so, yeah, I started then, and I taught um, a, a hundred back-to-back -back neon courses between 83 and 1997 and met really phenomenal people, really interesting people um, that really pushed the envelope on uh, trying different things. Uh, I, I challenged my students. They couldn't bring any type of glass in that I couldn't somehow make it light up. Hmm. And that, that was another thing that led to Lumen Glass uh, there were people making plate glass neon back then. Um, but yes, we, we did do for Corning uh, some essentially plate glass neon. So, uh, you know, there were influences around, but nobody had ever done what I did is put beads in a large open area and have the sort of the, the lighting randomly be switching throughout the whole thing so you have a lightning-like effect. So here's a question that immediately comes to mind off of that. Um, so I, I see the beads as like a structural element so that you don't – so you support thinner um, or thinner elements, uh, th thinner sheets of glass. Is that the same reason why you did that or was that part of the effect that you got out of using the beads? Well, it does uh, support the glass so it doesn't implode and um, – but it also, you, if you coat the beads, they're phosphor coated, and the discharges are going between thin channels between those beads, and it concentrates them into a bright arc. And uh, I used uh, xenon gas or krypton gas, which had a lot of UV, mm -hmm. and it would essentially illuminate the phosphors. Oh, so okay. originally I didn't 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 use phosphors like that. I uh, painted the phosphor on the glass itself and then put the beads in and somewhere along the line I decided to coat the, the beads themselves. Okay, so then like compared to what was already there as like the, the flat channel neon, were that gla was that yeah. glass thicker or was or were they much smaller to no, compensate that, for the... That was about the same. Okay. Remember, the, 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 it was water, water jet cut uh, channels. Um, Matter of fact, I was involved on the board of directors of Fallon Luminous Products, who eventually bought that process and had a plant in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and a kiln, I don't know, must have been nearly 100 yards long, 
where plates are laid up on one end, they go through on a conveyor and are fused, and at the end they're pumped and filled. And uh, but uh, eventually it just wasn't viable. Um, there weren't the numbers they needed and the consistent volume. That kiln cost them a fortune. I think it's something like fifty thousand a month to keep mm. that kiln running. Wow. So matter of fact, uh, Tim Fallon who was a president and a friend of mine at one point he, he said here's the keys to this plant you want it <laughs> <laughs> oh man I said, uh, yeah but you know that's with a fifty sixty thousand dollars a month to run the kiln uh, it's not such a good deal yeah it's time for a quick break i have just finished the four chapter series with geeks called intro to plasma here ben and rosco and i give an overview on plasma sculpture packing as many considerations into this process as we can. Through this series, I give a formal introduction to my beginnings in plasma, break down the anatomy of a plasma sculpture, and provide structural guidelines for creating a plasma vessel. We also cover an overview on the basic steps in checking and filling your plasma vessel, and discuss the difference between fabrication and collaboration when it comes to plasma. And lastly, we end on where you can start with a growing list of resources and supportive communities and groups. While this series is over, this overview will allow us to unpack questions and dive deeper into the specifics needed for progress and success in this medium. All questions are welcome, so please leave a comment on the YouTube on topics or questions you want me to dive into. Now back to the podcast. So then... um your interest in art has been has grown through this process from you know first being influenced by this co2 laser to working with neon and and understanding that mm-hmm. and becoming a writer did the did the art mindset seep in through um as you as you were uh, a writer for science of the times it's more my outside interest in doing art shows um in galleries and also uh large public art I started quite early on, actually, uh, boldly doing things that I've always done lots of projects where I get myself involved in something where I have quite honestly no idea how I'm going to do it when I get involved and just kind of stumble through and figure it out as I go along. So I was doing big monumental uh, pieces uh, quite early on, and I've always uh, made somewhat of a separation between the art and all the rest of the stuff. And then I've, I've really pushed, particularly since the mid-90s, to try to see that the field um, takes some of the art issues a little more seriously. And there's some great teachers out there right now who are, who are um, helping that. Sarah Blood, um, Amy Lemaire, uh, amongst others, who are really teaching some of the great art part of this, as opposed to just the technology, which I find very limiting and kind of boring. I mean, there's cool things, but you can't make an art piece just because it looks cool. Right. (laughs) Well, maybe. Are you talking about, like, the coolness of the – sometimes they go on hand hand in hand depending on your nature. Yeah, they do to some degree, but, yeah, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right right now, by the way, you called it a very uh, interesting time – you know, I, I develop a lot of new uh, lighting effects. Like you, you've seen you, when you were here, you saw the uh, spiraling tube. Mm-hmm. I've got a whole bunch of brand new effects here that uh, hope to be able to show you um, that are right at the cutting edge of physics. But there are things that nobody's ever seen before. And um, I'm sitting here looking at some effects that uh, I've spent the last 24 hours contacting uh, very high level scientists at Harvard and MIT trying to understand the physics of, but they're just beautiful and, and stunning. Um, so my, my interests go back and forth. I keep one foot in both worlds, the, the technical and the, the artistic. It, it, it's kind of like um, if you don't have your foot in both worlds, you're almost, you lose depth. Like it's kind of like how having two eyes allows you to see the depth of something, having your, having your interest aligned with both the, the scientific and invent, inventing mind and the creative and uh, expressive and aesthetic mind 
Mm-hmm. They they have they they exist in the same plane no matter what. But if you decide to discard or disproportionately weigh one or the other, you may not be able to find the answers that you were that you wouldn't be able to explore as much. I would have to say. I'd say that's one of the best analogies I've ever heard. Yeah, having binocular vision and being able to have you know the depth of perception and whatnot that you wouldn't get from one or the other. Yeah, I was I was like the first time I saw um, you post up the the tulpa. The kind of like the the pinwheel spinning one, that like blew my mind. Yep. I had no idea. I couldn't. I was like, "What is this thing he did? Like, how 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 do you, how do you go about like making the change? Because it's not big changes you're making. You have to make tiny changes, or else you won't know what exactly you did. How do you go about making tiny changes? Well, that's exactly what I'm working with now. Uh, is is a new version of the tulpa, and uh, I won't describe what tulpa is. T u l p a. But your listeners should look it up. It's a fascinating concept. And my assistant, Carrie, came up with a name to put on that particular uh, technique. Um, but the topa is what I'm working with now, but in entirely new ways. Um, we're producing effects. It's really even hard to describe them. I just, just A physicist friend of mine just left here. We can literally produce uh, circles and triangular suspended shapes in midair oh no it's not air but in mid tube and, and manipulate them wow. and it's really something uh, and they're as clear as day and um, uh, there's some electrical acoustical effects going on so there's, there's no sound but this is some sort of a, an acoustical effect within the tube hmm. and we don't understand it yet but uh, yeah because because many of your special effects are within fairly consistent shapes. Like, so for your toll bud, you have these long, large diameter tubes, and then you have right. this wire come through the center. So, you know, for our listeners, if they listen to Enter the Plasma, we often talk about how you could, if you change the shape of the tube or the, the vessel itself, that can influence how things will move around in that space. So you, you made sure to keep it consistent so that you have a consistent variable here, which is the tube diameter, which is very easy to control mm-hmm. rather than something that's very freeform. And then you've added this element, this wire that goes in between it. And this wire acts as a, as I guess you could call it a filament, but we'll just call it a wire. Um, and then now you have this uh, power supply in your, and you, your, your transformer that, that trans, transforms that energy and then you have, um, of course, you have your electrodes on there and whatnot, which connects to the wire, and you have your gas mixture. At this point, has it been changing anything on the transformer side, or has it more, been more about the play with with, with the, the gas or the wire? Um, no, the transformers, I, though I have a whole range of transformers I can try, finding the uh, variables are not as significant. With this particular one I'm playing with now, um, the tension of the wire, because I actually get the wire to move radically in the tube, uh, even though it's tensioned, um, and it moves through various uh, patterns, and um, oh. it's, it lights in very unusual ways. Um, it, it's hard, hard to describe. But when you see little bright triangles of light and have them morph into ovals and morph into other shapes that uh, I'm not even sure of their names for them. <laughs> and, and very consistently, too. Um, and very, very crisp. It's not like the beading effect you get from an end-to-end plasma. Mm-hmm. Um, this is very, very crisp uh, figures. And okay. um, another thing I'm playing with as I look across the room, you've seen these spiraling tubes. Well, I've essentially made a double chamber one where there's a, a vessel around a vessel. What? I'm trying to get a double double helix. Oh, my goodness. So not only get – but um, the physics there have become, uh, my, you know, head-scratching. Yeah. That the things don't interact the way you think they are. When you get uh, a discharge next to another discharge, then you're getting some magnetic effects. You get a little interference. Uh, between them, and yeah, and they do wild things. What's nice about these things is you can watch them in real time, and um, 
I just made some discoveries overnight, and I'm just about to try some more things uh, this afternoon. Awesome. Um, mm, it's fun. It's, a uh, again, bouncing back and forth between art and science. But uh, one of my areas that we sell to are science museums, and I'm trying to get uh, science museums to uh, get a little more creative in the things they buy. Mm-hmm. Uh, they keep buying the same four items over and over and over again, year after year. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the people behind science museums uh, often don't have a lot of science background. <laughs> and um, they're more, you know, uh, display builders. Mm-hmm. And um, so I try to get them excited by talking about some of the things that they could show. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how do you approach a discussion with someone who doesn't understand the science but are interested in these different displays? How do you go about convincing them to try new things that may involve a different set of display parameters? Well, I, what I try to do is get to the core of what they like to communicate. Um, you know, Plasma Globe doesn't teach you much about science because people don't think about it much but if i had a big linear tube uh maybe some magnets around where you know people could go up and with a magnet direct that discharge um we're doing a a solar science center now that uh proposing to have some pieces where people can really interact with the plasma Mm -hmm. with magnets which which shows if people think about it a little bit of our system written text here that's what's happening on the sun there's gigantic plasma obviously but there's also enormous magnetic effects that are shaping that plasma because plasma is very very sensitive to magnetic effects um you get a magnet within six inches of my spiraling tube it completely upsets the uh the discharge yeah i I witnessed that that very unique interaction because it doesn't happen on a normal um, or, or, or say a typical uh, plasma discharge. No, because too. that's AC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because what I'm working with is DC plasma. So. And then with those... You know, a lot of, of this stuff... Uh, okay, sorry, go ahead. I was, saying, I was saying with 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 those type of things, you have to also build in like the safety for that for like, do you also design the mounting or do you work with someone else to design how it mounts and sits so it doesn't get moved or pushed or anything like that? Oh, with, with the uh, trade show companies and museum builders, uh, they build the mountings okay. because they have, unfortunately nowadays in um, museums have almost become like uh, science themed museum uh, amusement parks Okay, yeah, where yeah, the, the rough, rough usage uh, uncontrolled, people feel like they have a license to go over and bang on, jump on, tear things apart. You have to make them almost bulletproof, which yeah. is unfortunate because yeah. there's not a lot of learning going on when you've got kids crawling all over uh, pieces uh, like that. And we've even started to get some business, unfortunately, where people have gone in and literally ripped a display out of its stand and thrown it on the floor to smash it. Wow. Um, yeah, the, the as a museum, a large museum, won't mention their name, have yeah. lost two hundred liter uh, size, twenty four inch diameter plasma globes. Kids going in and pulling them out of the oh my God. their mount and just throwing them on the floor and smashing them for fun. <sighs> that's upsetting. You know, that's a uh, that's really that's upsetting. Thousand dollar piece of glass. <laughs> so, yeah. Is that? That's is that not in, not including the gas or including the gas in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, yeah. Oh my goodness. There's a lot of gas. People don't realize in some of these pieces, and uh, you start using you know like xenon based gases. Yeah, they're, they're quite pricey. I, I just bought a tiny little tank, you know, about the size of a loaf of bread. <laughs> it was yeah. Thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah. So. <laughs> You don't want to leave the wrong valve open, you know. That's oh, yeah. You know, you're, like, extra careful now. You're, like, just like, – you get a checklist. You're, like, checking it with a microscope. <laughs> Did I close it all the way? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But I'd say, you know, uh, another interest of mine, I, I throw it out because it's something that involved with the last few years is uh, people are interested in this. Go back in history and read um, the great experimenters who 
essentially helped develop this field is so inspiring. I, I read every night about people like Michael Faraday and Maxwell and Geisler and whatever. And a lot of the stuff that's being done today is often very cheap version of what they did better back in the 19th century and with much more um, open bounds of what they tried. And um, like the spiraling tube came directly out of uh, understandings of what Michael Faraday came out with and understood back in the 1830s. So those of your listeners, I, I'd strongly recommend reading uh, there's some really fantastic books. I've got one on my desk here. If you want to read one good book on the history of electricity, it's Draw the Lightning Down by Michael Schiffer. Tremendous book. Yeah, but you can find copies of that uh, very readily. And whether it's your library or on Amazon or uh, even right. free copies, PDFs, older versions of it, and older prints, uh, same story, mm -hmm. just older print. And, uh, yeah, it's really something to uh, to read and look into. It's a fascinating history, the history of the three elements that make up our plasma world, you know, electricity, vacuum, and glass. Uh, electricity by far got the more, most interesting story, but... Uh, they're all interesting. Is there anything else that you uh, would like to share with our audience? Well, that's the one thing, that, you know, uh, reading the history uh, give you a good mindset for um, to learn this field. Um, taking classes and um, whatnot are fine and books are fine, but every single electrical experimenter throughout history that I've ever read basically looked at what other people did repeated their experiments, learned from that, and then added their next little bit. And so there aren't any real completely independent researchers because they all stood on the shoulders of those people who came before them. Also, in every period in history, they came up with their own explanations of why things worked. And more than not, those explanations were largely wrong. So it makes me wonder about our own time with our own level of understanding. We think of ourselves as so superior technically, but what's going to be looked back at about our time of what we don't know? And um, many physicists point to a lot of things in our, our world that they say this idea has got to fall. We're waiting for the next genius to explain what's actually happening here. And, um, so having a sense of humility about you're just part of the process, I think is really a good mindset for this. And uh, going back and, and looking at what these other people did and how they did it um, will, will teach you a great deal. Yeah, just well, the freedom. Said. They have so much less to work with, and yet they did so much. If you look at the work of Geisler, I mean, not only was one of the greatest glass blowers in history. But he invented the, the vacuum pump that was um, ultimately brought vacuum levels down many ma orders of magnitude. And he used phosphors for largely the first time. And those guys came up with getters. And uh, the transformer was being developed then. I mean, they did so much. Um, and there's still things from those time periods that and I've been researching for years, some of these guys and what they did. And I haven't got a clue how they did it. With our technology and all the resources we have, I have no idea how they were able to do it. Uh, one example is, uh, I think I've talked to you, Percy, about Daniel McFarlane Moore. Mm -hmm. um, worked in Edison's shop um, and went out on his own. And he came up with the first tubular lighting, the precursor to fluorescent lighting. But he regularly, around the world, had... I don't know how many installations where they went on, like the, in the subway system of London, they would build one tube on site, 275 feet long, and light it up. What? I tried making 32-foot uh, uh, more tubes and a hard time getting that thing to start. Um, how they made it almost 10 times as long, made it out of uh, close to two two-inch soft glass outdoors, and we're able to run that on carbon dioxide it is beyond me. I really, I would love to get together with some people some point somewhere 
and actually try to make one of these things. But maybe some of your listeners are interested. <laughs> you know, I really hope so. Um, but it's a really good point. We stand on the successes of those to come before us. And since progress is slow, the best we can do to move things forward is to add just a little bit more. And uh, shoot, I, I'm, I'm trying to think about You said CO2 uh, yeah. tubes, uh, more tubes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look that up. That sounds, that sounds pretty fascinating. Oh well, I've God. got probably every bit of published information on more there is. matter of fact, uh, my assistant and I have actually been in touch with his heirs. We've had conference calls with all his heirs, and we've actually taught them about their own ancestor. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. It was, I mean, he came up with his own power supplies, too. These were essentially um, uh, Rumkorf coils, if you know what that is, like our spark coil. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. But on a, but on a gigantic scale. And, um, and uh, by the way, a CO2 tube is a beautiful white light. As a matter of fact, it was used in uh, art galleries and photography studios because the white was so perfect. But you had to have what they call a breather valve to keep, uh, putting in a little puff of CO2 because it was constantly being used up. And you want to see an elegant thing, you should see the elegant breathing valve that Moore came up with, where he generated on site his own um, carbon dioxide by putting um, marble chips in acid, which produces CO2. And then he had this elaborate control mechanism that just as the tube used up the CO2, it would give it a little puff more. And those huh. tubes would last for 5,000 continuous hours. That's amazing. That's crazy. And they ran up till uh, just before World War II in England, believe it or not. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time, Wayne. Uh, I- I'd love to reach back out to you for more podcasts. I know there's a lot we could talk about. Um, and I really appreciate you taking the time today. So, yeah. More than happy to, sure. Well, you're doing this great work in uh, tapping so many interesting people, and Thank you. we really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Taming Lightning Podcast. Music credits to the following artists. Retro, by one. Sunnyside, by one. Boost, by Joaquin Karud. Serenity, produced by Ready Man. And The Process, by Lakey Inspired. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. I appreciate Wayne for sharing more about his background, and you can't help but feel his excitement when he talks about his new discoveries and research. Of our many discussions and talks off the mic, this has made me realize how young the internet truly is. There are loads of people whom we do not know anything about, especially their early beginnings, who are doing some amazing work. This is only an introduction. Be ready for more conversations with Wayne in the future, So if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to go over, submit your questions in the comments on the blog for episode 38 on taminglightning.net. I'd like to thank Pittsburgh Glass Center for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration. The Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge and connects me to some amazing and supportive people. Additionally, I'd like to extend thanks to Chris Clark, the Director of Operations at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, for recommending Wayne for our first plasma class in 2018, as this and subsequent connections have been most valuable thus far in my career. If you'd like to support Taming Lightning, subscribe to the newsletter on www.taminglightning.net or follow on Instagram at Taming Lightning. Other options for support are donations through coffee, spelled ko-fi.com slash taminglightning, where you can donate for the price of a $3 cup of coffee. Links will be provided in the show notes. Feel free to share, comment, and subscribe. And as always, be safe, be healthy, and be strong. And I'll see you next time.